I welcome you to the third uh, session of Amy Jill Levine's, or AJ, huh? Levine? Mm -hmm. Levine? Uh, anyway, uh, <laughs> we're glad that you're here and you're participating, and we hope that you get something really good and powerful out of tonight's session, which they, we have uh, developed two really great, uh, or we have asked two great speakers <laughs> to talk to us. Who are they? Yeah, <laughs> good question. <laughs> and it's going to be Katie Ferguson <laughs> and Rita Winters, and you will be impressed. <laughs> So we're glad to have them. I also need to remind you, this is the third week. Next week is the fourth week, and, it, and AJ comes on the fifth week. We need to ask her questions. So get your questions in to either uh, Vic, Victoria or myself or even Carl uh, so we can have them and we can look like we're we're doing we're like we really studied her work. <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, I hope that you do that. Uh, and and uh, no question uh, small enough. Just I've already got my question, but I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> so anyway, uh, there was one other thing. Oh, to, I already told you tonight, speakers. I think Victoria, have I covered everything? Say. Then we look Victoria. forward to hearing. We we look forward to hearing from the Merrills next week. Oh, that's what I wanted. Yes, the Merrills, and keep our dearly dear leader. Uh, Victoria, in your prayer, she she can't talk tonight very well, so uh, she's got uh, a, cold, a strong cold, and she's fighting it. But she she wanted to be be seen by all of us and know that she's <laughs> with us, even if all she is is with ears. <laughs> so with with fur no further ado, I'm going to give you it over to Katie, who will lead us in prayer. Loving God, God of Joseph and Mary. Thank you for choosing to appear to us as a helpless child. Thank you for this time to study with others and learn more a lot about the lives of Mary and Joseph and their journey to Bethlehem. Amen. 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 Carl, you want to lead us in with our video for tonight? I'll be glad to. As far as we can tell from the Gospel of Matthew, Joseph and Mary have a home in Bethlehem. They relocate first to Egypt because Joseph, once again warned in a dream, is told, take the baby to Egypt because Herod the king wants to kill him. And when Joseph, again in a dream, learns that Herod had died, instead of returning to Bethlehem, where Herod's son, Herod Achelaus, is on the throne, he relocates up north to Galilee to a very small village called Nazareth and hence we have Jesus of Nazareth. But we have a different story in the Gospel of Luke. According to Luke, Joseph and Mary already live in Galilee and Nazareth. And because of this famous census that went out from Caesar Augustus that the entire world be enrolled, Joseph, along with Mary, his fiance, who was quite pregnant, move from Galilee in the north to Bethlehem in the south. Here's how the CEB puts it. In those days, Caesar Augustus declared that everyone throughout the empire should be enrolled in the tax lists. Well, we don't actually have evidence of an empire-wide enrollment. Luke's point is less here historical rigor than setting Jesus on the world stage and giving us, giving Luke's readers the option. What Lord should be yours? The one who discombobulates an entire empire for the sake of taxes. In other words, for the sake of money going to him. Or this baby, who will be shortly born and then placed in a stable. We are told the first enrollment occurred when Quirinius was governor of Syria. That's also an historical problem. But Luke has a reason for stressing Quirinius and stressing the census. And we know that from the book of Acts, which is Luke volume two. In Acts chapter five, Gamaliel, a Pharisee and a member of the Sanhedrin, gets up and gives a speech 
to his fellow authorities, explaining why they should leave Peter and John and the rest of the church alone. And he says, well, remember at the time of the census, that was the census under Quirinius. It took place a couple of years later. And because of that census, there was actually a tax revolt led by somebody called Judas the Galilean. If we read Luke's story in light of Acts chapter 5, we get a very profound message, and the message comes from the census. Luke is telling us this new movement is not violent, it's not revolutionary, it's not about to take up arms and challenge the empire by using might against might and arms against arms. This is a new movement, whereas we learn from Mary's Magnificat, the rich will be pulled down and the poor will be lifted up, but it will be done by grace and kindness and compassion and not by government and not by armaments. We are told that Joseph, who belonged to David's house and family line, went up from the city of Nazareth in Galilee to David's city called Bethlehem in Judea. City, by the way, is pretty generous for Nazareth, maybe 50, 75 people. A small town as most of the villages in Lower Galilee were. He went to be enrolled together with Mary, who was pregnant. And while they were there, the time came for Mary to have her baby. She gave birth to her firstborn child, a son, wrapped him snugly, and we'll probably remember the King James Version of swaddling clothes, and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the guest room. And then countless Christmas stories explained that they banged on door after door and all these mean innkeepers would not let them in. You're too poor, you're too dirty, you're from the wrong side of town. All of that is nonsense. The point of the story is that there was no room in the guest room for Mary to have the necessary privacy to have a baby. That's not the sort of thing you want to be done in public. The issue is not ritual purity. The issue is not poverty. The issue is privacy. So Mary gives birth to her child, wraps him snugly, and lays him in a manger. And again, we get it wrong. We think about manger as a sweet little bed. We miss Luke's point. A manger is a feeding trough. And anybody who ever studied French would know that. The French word manger, M-A-N-G-E-R, means to eat. This is Luke's symbolism. Jesus will become bread for the world. Jesus will meet people at table. Jesus will make food appear miraculously. Jesus will have a significant final supper that he will ask his followers to reenact. Where else do you put this special baby but in a feeding trough to symbolize the food, the messianic banquet, the coming together of disparate people from disparate backgrounds, all at a common table. And making this manger scene even more profound, one image that first century Jews had of the messianic world, the kingdom to come, the world to come, the kingdom of heaven is a giant banquet where everyone eats together, everyone is comforted, and everyone has enough. We might be able to experience that, or churches could, at a Eucharist, or a church supper, or any time they say, give us this bread. The manger scene evokes all of that and more. After the baby is born, an annunciation comes to shepherds who are outside keeping watch over their flock, which by the way tells us that the scene as Luke envisions it is not taking place in cold December because the shepherds would not be outside and neither would the sheep be. So we're probably thinking early springtime, maybe March or April. The shepherds hear the good news, glory to God in the highest, and they rush to greet the baby and his mother. And again, so many people get it wrong by talking about how the shepherds are impure or unclean. That's not the case here. Shepherds are not among the wealthy. They're probably among the poor. And these may in fact be the shepherds who guard the flocks that belong to the temple. 
because sheep were used as part of the sacrificial offering. The point here is that the people attending the baby in this stable are not the royal courtiers. They're not the elite. They're not the kingdom representatives. But they're the representatives of this new kingdom, the common people not impure or unclean, but just average everyday people, and everyday people who, by the way, take care of others. The shepherds care for the sheep, and they visit Mary and the baby, Joseph and Mary, who take care of the child. In the Gospel of Matthew, Joseph has to protect Mary and the newborn child from the outrages of Herod the Great. The shepherds in the Gospel of Luke protect the sheep and Joseph and Mary protect the baby. I think here, one of the major profound ideas about Christmas is that we need to take care of God. Part of the Jewish tradition suggests here in the words of the famous rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, that God is in search of man or better, God is in search of us. God wants to be in relationship with us but relationship has to be a two-way street. Not only does God take care of us, not only does God bring justice and compassion into the world, but we also take care of God here embodied in this helpless newborn child. According to the Gospel of Luke, when Jesus is eight days old, Mary and Joseph arrange his circumcision, his initiation into the covenant with Israel. They're a good Jewish family, a pious Jewish family, and they also go to the temple. When the time came for their ritual cleansing in accordance with the law of Moses, they brought Jesus up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. And that's where we have the prophecy of Simeon, and we also meet the prophet Anna, two prophets, male and female together, welcoming baby Jesus. Following this, Mary and Joseph relocate back to their home in Nazareth in Galilee. The Gospel of Matthew will tell us a different story. When Mary and Joseph are still in Bethlehem after the child is born, they receive a visit. So instead of going to the temple and meeting people there, in the Gospel of Matthew, people come to them. Those are the Magi. I just wanted to say that so far we have talked about Luke's version of the birth narrative. And in the first week, we heard about Zachariah and Elizabeth and John the Baptist's birth. Second week, we read about Mary's story, her visit to Elizabeth and the Magnificat. And finally, this week, we are at the birth of Jesus. And Levine states that Luke, which I thought was an interesting statement, focuses on Mary's perspective as opposed to Matthew's version where he will focus more on um, Joseph's pers perspective. So let me pull up the slides that we have for tonight. Light of the world. The first section, and we just kind of went through this um, as far as the sections that were in the book. The first one is called the census, and I want you to think about what your ahas or surprises were. And Luke sets this time in relation to a census, and I just, and certainly AJ brought that up. Is there something that you would like to add to that? What that means that it is where this census has taken place. I was blown away that it didn't happen. <laughs> yeah. You no, know, and it's like EFM. Everything <laughs> that you have thought was happened or, or we got it wrong, you know, and things just got um, mixed up. But yeah, I was really surprised that it did not take place at that time. And that it was that it, then she made the decision that it was more theological than historical. And which is kind of like we sometimes we vacillate between wanting the Bible to be very historical and very accurate because people want evidence. And then when it isn't there, 
you know, naysayers will go, well, see, you don't have any evidence for it. But what does it what does it mean? She has said, she's told us on several occasions that more than one thing can be right. And the word right gets kind of complicated, particularly when you commingle the notion of theology and the role of theology in our lives and history and the role of history. I once remarked to David McGinnis, who was the priest in Tuscaloosa, that I was reading a book called The Historical Jesus. And I will not put words into David's mouth, but in essence, what he said to me was, be a little careful about this desire to dot every I and cross every T with the history. And might there be other reasons? And that is what I heard Amy, J., Amy Jill say, was that the fact that maybe there's no record in the Roman archives of a census, but the idea that there was a census is important because it showed, in effect, the role of government and what government was trying to do versus what the people needed. Did I say that kind of sort of close to right? Let, let me read let me read exactly what she says, because this is where you're talking about, I think, Carl. We see here the power of Rome, power based on monarch money and military. And we also know Luke is providing an alternative the kingdom of God based on care of the poor servant leadership and treasures in heaven. And the, just the sentence before, she was just saying, as Carl did, that a census was used to determine the local tax base and the number of men who could be inscripted into military service, not the way we use it today, um, sort of to, um, you know, kind of graph the socioeconomic um, levels of different peoples in different places and all that. Yeah, what page is that on that you were reading? That was 84. <clears throat> and also, I think it kind of sets, sets the stage as far as what was going on. I mean, after all, Luke is written, I'll just say two generations after Jesus's birth. And so we just, you know, it's just trying to tell tell everybody, even though they probably are still living in this Roman rule, but just what it was like. It was hard. I mean, I'm thinking like in, in my time, um, JFK, when he was president, what it was like back then. I mean, it was, you know, you had the air raids or the, the bomb shelters. You had the Cuban crisis, just what was going on in the land at that time. But yet I still struggle. <laughs> I struggled. I know that Luke was a historian and a doctor and, and, and mm. well learned. And it is 60 or 70 AD when he's writing this gospel, somewhere in that range, maybe 80. But if I would know if I read it that I mean, not everybody, but if he was right, it depends who he's writing to. Is he writing to Gentiles who wouldn't know the story anyway? Or is he writing to Jews that would know that <coughs> there was no census? Uh, or is it, you know, I, so I go both ways. I, I see the truth in both as she does, but I still, st I'm not ready to give up the, 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 uh, <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, um, giving up the uh, census right yet there's a lot yet to be discovered uh, historically perhaps that maybe there was a a, a, a a census there that pushed them out a smaller one I don't know but uh, I don't know it's just same as the virgin birth I, I can go both ways in that I can give a theology for both ways and they both probably be right uh, but I but that's where my heart is it struggles with these truths 
and I look into myself to see well, what do I really believe and can I believe both of them does it make is it that big a matter that there was a a, a, sen a census or not right. I, I don't know but somebody I, who was there I liked, say, <laughs> go ahead. I liked her Tate and she wasn't bothered about the technicality of the historical details she emphasized that Rome was in control. Rome and uh, Joseph and Mary were obedient to it, that they were not going to use this mm -hmm. event to usher in some kind of a military uprising, right. which I had not heard that uh, interpretation, but it, it makes sense. So it really didn't matter. How, I mean, how either, either Luke goes through a long dissertation about how Rome is in control or he just says, and there's a census, and everyone had to obey what Rome said, basically. Mm -hmm. And they did. You know, most um, most church historians, this has been an issue for almost 2,000 years because people know Luke as being one who is fastidious historically and trusted God above all in theology. And that's the side they keep coming Back, back on is is um, really where she landed, that this was a way to let us all know this was a government of oppression and this was the king coming into our lives in a manger, humbly and through love. I'm sure you're going to get to it, but the thing, I'm sorry, Alice has got something. No, 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 go ahead. Go ahead, Carl. I'm sure you're going to get to it, but the thing that, that, that struck me so by her, the video, and it'll come up in the text, and Kat, thank you, your, your articulation of the text was said it so much better than I even came close to saying, was her notion of the banquet, mm -hmm. the nature is banquet, and huge wide arms, and, and her point that she made um, about the fact that who showed up but the shepherds? It wasn't, it, it wasn't a white tie affair. It was for the people. And I think that's, to me, that's the reason that she talks about they had to go because government had to collect more money and they were going to do a census. I, I accept it not as fact, but as important theology. Um, because it, it says who the king is. Our king. Right. If they didn't have a census, then why did they go in the first place? They, they I was no. going. I was going to say something silly. I won't say that. Alice, <laughs> Alice, Alice will answer that for you. That's a great question, Mary. But um, I really liked AJ's energy and mood at this video more than the other two. For some reason, I really enjoyed her more. But she said, "What Lord shall be yours?" And that made me stop and think, you know, we were talking, she was sort of relating to the king, the rule maker, the census, the whole government versus this man, this humble man born to this humble couple in a manger um, who was going to help, help the poor rise up and uh, all that good stuff. And I just love that thought. Um, it spoke to me that that statement that she made. Yeah, thank you. I am going to move this one on. So, Katie, how about bringing us in as soon as I get there? But how do I get rid of this? Do you guys see a black screen? No. Cow. The birth of Jesus. Okay. Aha, so surprising. Looks good. Well, this is the correct slide, the birth of Jesus. Um, All right. And, and as Rita has titled all of these, ahas or surprises, I love, I love her, her, um, uh, what's the proper word? Um, uh, it's not really a subtitle, but at any rate. <laughs> her byline? Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. But anyway, it's, I, I thought it was good. I thought it was really good. Um, okay, so uh, another surprise. So I've got my space heater on down here. I'm turning it off. It's kind of noisy. Another surprise was, um, one thing she uses is the um, CBE translation of the Bible, which I've forgotten now what that stands for, and I didn't write it down. 
Uh, common uh, Era Bible. Common Era Bible. And that or Common not, English. Uh, Is it Common, common Era or Common English? English? I was not familiar with it. I don't think Rita was familiar with it. Uh, it was all. It was all new to us, and um, that's one thing we hope. Uh oh, we have to get the answer to. Uh, when she talks to us is, is uh, why she chose that one. But in that one, it calls, it says it's a guest room and not the, the there's no guest room for, for Mary and Joseph. And um, it's not um, what she says, what we've always been told about no room in the end. Um, I'm aware that AJ is very sensitive to being pictured, Jews being pictured as bad guys, which I guess it kind of makes some sense. And earlier this year, Carl and I attended a lecture on Zoom entitled Understanding Jesus Means Understanding Judaism. It was done by the Vancouver School of Theology. It was really, really interesting. And the focus of it was to make her listeners sensitive to all the things that Christians do, especially in our churches, that serve to denigrate Jews. And as a result, she hopes to encourage us to change some of our behaviors. So that is one of her missions, I think, is to try to to um, make us all more enlightened about that. And so I think that she's probably more sensitive than Christians would be about that. And that's why I think that she brought this up is that it's it's not the mean Jew in Hebrew, Jewish in Hebrew. It's that there just wasn't a proper place for her to have this baby. Um, well, we don't even uh, know the ethnicity of the innkeeper. Right. It would have been a Gentile. Well, you know what it you know what it made me think of were hostels in Europe. Yes, especially when AJ said, um, you know, it, it wasn't that there wasn't room; it's that there was not a private room. In yeah. other words, it does make sense to me that people could have just had you know, beds spread out next to each other or pallets or whatever. Right. And there, you know, there was no place that had walls that mm -hmm. for them. Yeah, I think that's what she was yeah, indicating. Mm -hmm. um, I'd, I'd never heard that at all. And it could have been that she was just, it, that it was, the rooms were just full and mm -hmm. she, and we make we make this big thing into it on how these innkeepers are are were nasty people. <coughs> we wouldn't let our uh, Mary in when it could have been they were just full and had nowhere else to put her, and she was yeah. pregnant. And my gosh, and so it all makes sense. Right. That way. I, I she needed never, privacy. Yeah, I had never heard that the innkeepers were mean. Me either. I, I didn't yeah. ever grow up hearing that story. Nor, nor, nor that the um, shepherds were dirty. I always heard the shepherds yeah, were impure. on duty. They were doing their God. job. Yeah. Now, sort of I stuff. assumed that they were smelly, but that wasn't that. I, I agreed that that wasn't the point. Yeah. <laughs> we didn't. We didn't get you know the angels going. Whoo. <laughs> I I think about the innkeepers though. It was just sort of implied that it was this pregnant woman, maybe. She was maybe they knew she was in labor, maybe they didn't. It was this pregnant woman, and they couldn't find any place to put her. I think it's just sort of implied. I don't. I'm not saying that I necessarily thought they were being mean, but but I understand how some people could think that, and where she's coming from with that. Um, this this does it make any difference to you all whether or not it was because there was no guest room, as she says, no private place, or that they just. Doesn't doesn't make any difference. Doesn't make any difference to me. I, I liked her explanation that you haven't she's having a baby. It's not something you do where there's gonna be people coming in and out. She needed privacy. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. I think privacy is a more modern term in some ways than it is a, an old uh, ancient term as such, if you understand right. what I'm trying to say. But I guess uh, as a Jewish it was a little privacy. <laughs> Well, and as a Jewish woman, wouldn't she have, uh, you know, other women around her who would assist her? And maybe she grew up knowing how to deliver a baby. I mean, I think of all of those particular things that <laughs> go on when you're given a baby, given birth. Joseph, Sorry, had to go, 
Joseph had to get right in there, I'm sure. I know. I know. There was nobody else there. What did you yeah, do? Yeah, she didn't have all of it. Yeah. She might have been at home. And we're not right. given the, you know, all the details. Right. right. Mary has some privacy after all. She does. <laughs> Thank goodness for her. <laughs> Well, then she tells us that Jesus, that Bethlehem means in Hebrew means house of bread. Mm -hmm. Now, do you think that he's being born in, in Bethlehem? Is that just a coincidence? Or do you think that has any particular meaning? Oh, I think it's quite, uh, God knew what he was doing. <laughs> I loved her, her theological reflection of, uh, the manger me too mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. and people people uh, mistake manger and stable and you know as, as one and the same and I, I think those need to be pointed out that they are not mm -hmm. um, one of the things I did when um, uh, looking for uh oh is that me is that Do y'all hear in that tone? That may be, I may have some papers on my keyboard, but I can't do that. Um, I was looking, this is, a, this is a picture Rita found and she had another one and um, uh, I thought the page was too close. So I just have one on here, but um, the, uh, and, and at the time Jesus was born, the feeding trough was probably um, rock that was carved out as a trough. Although if there were wooden ones, they didn't survive. The stone ones are still, they've got some, the stone ones are still, they found some of the stone ones, but if they were wooden, they, they haven't survived. But, um, so it was really maybe more like, more like a trough as we think of as a trough instead of the wooden one, I don't know. But that also goes along with feeding. And, wow. and, and as she says, um, uh, um, it's anticipating the communion story. Um, and she says, and it's over here on the right, by locating Jesus in the manger, Luke is anticipating the communion story. Now, that implies that maybe he wasn't really put in the manger, that this is something Luke just said. What do you all think about that? Is she saying that Luke just decided that that would be a good place, that would be good for storytelling? <laughs> Well, I'd say if they were diverted to somewhere else other than the inn, didn't the innkeeper say there's some place in the stable? She sent them to the, yeah, she doesn't talk about that, but that's why, that's why we learned it. That's why I learned it. Mm -hmm. And so. It's probably what was available. Right. Uh, and so they would have a trough, a feeding area for the oh, yeah. oh, animals. Yeah. And if you go, and if you go to the church nativity day and you go down to where the, the birth took, allegedly took place. Oh my. <laughs> Sorry. I, 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 I wonder if it's, I wonder if Luke is looking back and yeah. thinking about what Christ has said all those years. Uh -huh. And being the bread of the world and uh, um, uh, the lamb of God and uh, those sorts of things. And there is a tradition that uh, that Luke went and talked to Mary and got her memoirs, so to speak. Uh, she probably she very well could have been still alive in the 60s, 70s, because uh, she was, you know, in 30, she was 13. So she could have been alive and she was living uh, in Patmos, supposedly, with uh, John, who was taking care of her. And uh, so he, I've also heard that Luke spoke uh, with Peter, but the, Peter didn't stay. I don't know how long he stayed around, but he could have gone. To, but that's where he got a lot of his information and how he was placed in a manger perhaps came from that. And, I don't know. And, and it's also, um, we have to remember that these were prophesied in um, scripture. And so these are the fulfillment of prophecies. And Matthew was so very careful to, because he was, Matthew was Jewish. His name was Levi. He knew the scripture and the others followed some of what Matthew said. And then Luke wanting to bring this to, to all of us and the Gentiles, but still staying with 
what the Old Testament had said, the Old Testament pointing to Jesus. And um, like in, in Micah 5, 2, it says, But you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, are only a small village among all the people of Judah. Yet a ruler of Israel will come from you, one whose origins are from the distant past. The people of Israel, and it gets how a woman will give birth there, and he will lead the flock, and he will be the Lord. And we usually read that passage um, during this time of, of Advent. So they were familiar and had been talking so much among themselves and sharing that deep faith with one another. Right. Obviously, Luke got this from somewhere his own work uh, mm -hmm. uh, but the other ones obviously there's parts that of matthew in luke and there's parts of mark in in luke also so they had those as resources also although this is outside of those spheres because all of these first couple chapters is is unique to luke wait, wait, we probably need to move on, but I do have a quick question, Bill. What, where, where is this information? Are these in other historical writings about Luke going and talking to Mary and getting her? Um, it's tradition. I don't. I'll, I'll have to. I'll have to dig. For okay, it, I'm just curious about what. Okay. I mean, okay. it could have happened by not. I mean, <laughs> but I'll. It was a, a tradition that I in well, seminary it, or somewhere they mentioned it. It. I mean, it doesn't seem illogical. It seems very logical to me. It's as, as possible as anything. <laughs> mm -hmm. All, right, All right, let's talk about the shepherds. And a song there, isn't it? I don't know. Must be a shepherd <laughs> anyway, Luke talks about the shepherds. And of course, the angel comes. And the first thing the angel says is, oh, don't be afraid. <laughs> We've heard that line so very many times. Um, anyway, um, she says, when the gospel speaks about good news, the content has to be more than you will have eternal life. Any comments for that? And this is the good news that the angels bring. Eternal life is off in the future. So I think what the child in the flesh represents is the good good news now um, that there is this there's kind of a new roadmap of how peace can happen even under Roman rule in a di in a different way, not through a military conquest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and Levine does bring out. Um, the term salvation in um, relationship to the Old Testament is respite from war, hunger, plague, and oppression. And the focus of Luke's good news or salvation is that consolation and comfort that the Old Testament talks about and sin, salvation from sin and death. And just like you said, it is the now and yet it is also in the future. Mm -hmm. I think just expand Could, and, and it and it and it comes to all people. The inclusiveness of the message to me was very, very significant. Yes, yes, that it was intended it, for all. It does it also to... does it also fit in with the, the good news is that in ultimately, when Jesus answers which is of the commandments is the most important, and he says, love God and love each other, that the good news really is to focus on his grace, to focus on his forgiveness of us for our sins, and to build on, build on love, um, as he stated it, and love God and love each other. Um, Amy Jill gets a little bit tense when people talk about the vengeful God of the Old Testament and the loving God of the New Testament. I don't think we want to go down that road. But to me, the good news really focused on God's grace and love. 
Which is definitely good news. Which is definitely good news. Mm -hmm. I, I liked that. Um, Message the beep. Say transfer. Say it again. I I didn't say that, but I'll uh, I stop. <laughs> um, I liked that the shepherds. No command was heard after the. Uh, I like that the shepherds heard the angels. They said, let's go. And they went. And I don't know what they did with their flock. We always see one or two sheep <laughs> at the, you know, at the stable uh, near the manger. And, um, but, uh, but then uh, they're called the, like the first evangelists. Because they went probably and told everyone what they had seen, what had happened to them. And that firsthand experience is not to be denied. They were small flocks and they brought them with them. So the, <laughs> the, the sheep showed up too. <laughs> well, one of the things and, and it, that I really had to think about was the fact that the sign for the yeah. shepherds of this good news, right. you're just going to see a baby that's wrapped in clothes. Just an I ordinary mean, baby. Wow. So what kind of a, a, I mean, that's just an ordinary event. And yet that is the sign that they are to look for. Mm -hmm. the, the thing that struck me was, um, and I, it was written kind of funny because it said um, the bands of cloth, which we all probably heard swaddling clothes, uh, have biblical connotation. We need to go to the Catholic, Anglican, and Orthodox canons. And I don't understand what that sentence has to do with anything. But according to the wisdom of Solomon, oh, I know, okay, wisdom of Solomon that those swaddling clothes, those bands were, were kings. All the kings had been wrapped in that way. And that symbolized that this baby was a king and not just an ordinary run of the mill baby. Where was that, Caroline? On page 87, the last full paragraph. Is it drawn from, is it drawn from Mark or from Luke? Because Luke is, Luke, Luke is, it's from Luke, but it's referring to the wisdom of Solomon. Oh, okay. Because right, it's Luke's, down at the bottom of uh, bottom of page eighty-seven. In the, yeah, the last paragraph in eighty-seven. In mm -hmm. in the C in the CEB, all Luke says is she gave birth to her first born child, a son, wrapped him snugly, and laid him in a manger. And that's actually all that's said in Luke, in the CEB. Right. right, but the King James goes back to swaddling clothes, which the typical stories we've heard, but it does refer to the wisdom of Solomon. It said, no, kings have not entered any other way. So that's what was important about that, about wrapped in the, you know, in the bands of claw. Right, and the, the paragraph goes on to say he came into the world the same way every other baby comes in and he's going to go out of the world, you know, the way we all will go. We must die. I, I, I noticed a, a connection in, in Luke speaking purposefully about the, the way the baby was the action of that Mary took to lovingly wrap the baby it made me think of Jesus uh, being you know very lovingly wrapped even though it had to be in a hurry um, because the Sabbath was coming when he died mm -hmm. and the the scriptures made a big deal about when Lazarus died and Jesus raised him the way Lazarus was wrapped and Jesus, you know, raised him up and the way Jesus was wrapped and his wrappings lay folded specifically on the altar of his death. 
And I, it, you know, that, that whole thing just uh, it was almost like a tie in to me of um, this baby carries so much hope this ordinary baby that was lovingly cared for by its mother um, carries so much hope and new life, which, you know, those wrappings signify Jesus's new life because he threw them off and folded them up. Mm -hmm. I had an, an aha about the shepherds. I'd love to share if that's okay. Yes, please. Um, I was just listening to a podcast that was talking about the book of Samuel when Jesse brings all of his sons in front of Samuel to see who would be anointed. And King David, a little boy at the time, was off tending the sheep. He was a shepherd. Mm -hmm. He was just a young child as a shepherd, and he was the one that was anointed to become king. And so I see a connection there to, to Luke mentioning the shepherds and the shepherds being a very important part of the story, sort of connecting the line of David in with this story, because that's, you know, part of the prophecy and part of the, the story is Jesus being from the line of David. And David was also from very humble beginnings, very, um, you know, he wasn't the oldest son. He wasn't the most grand or, or wisest, you know, he was just a, a humble shepherd and he became, you know, the the great king of Israel, the, you know, the, the one who kind of un, was supposed to be undoing a lot of the, the bad things that Saul did. So I just, I thought that was a, an interesting kind of throwback to that story of, of a king. And we do hear a lot about David in the, the, in the season of Advent as well. That's so that good. was my aha about shepherds and, and connecting good. it to David. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> My, I am my aha. Uh -huh. uh, yes. Uh, just one yes. more thing. My aha uh -huh was I'm pretty sure Professor Levine said the swelling clothes, I was Googling it in a minute ago, was to restrict a baby so a baby doesn't scratch themselves and is, more, is safer. And she said something about God takes care of us, but we have an obligation. We take care of God. So in this sense, we, we, Mary and Joseph and the shepherds were literally taking care of God, God with us. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Very good. Very good. Okay. Who's up? Marking Jewish identity. Um, one of her many, many books, um, AJ has written is called The Misunderstood Jew. And in it, she illustrates the, all the wasted effort that goes into what she says, obscuring, distorting, explaining away, or ignoring the simple fact that Jesus was a practicing Jew. I think that goes back to her mission that she sees as trying to make us all more sensitive to, um, to all of that. Um, so uh, Luke continues to emphasize how embedded Mary, Joseph, and Jesus are in the Jewish traditions. How do you all feel about it? she? And the quote over here on page 96, ritual when performed with full understanding helps to anchor our identity. How do you, how do you feel about rituals and whether or not they're important to your, to your faith and, and well, and to, to other aspects of your life too, but um, particularly to your faith. Well, we probably have all had communion since we were very young and understanding the, the ritual, the um, symbols, even the signs. I really like the way she uses signs of the, the communion. I feel like I've learned um, through the years, it's, it has affected me differently and my understanding has grown so much through the years of taking communion. And I would say that would be the, one of the first traditions that I would think of that, that truly has impacted me and what I pass along to others. As um, 
Mary, Joseph, and Jesus being embedded in the Jewish tradition, I would expect, truthfully, I'd expect nothing more. <laughs> that's who wrote the Gospels for the most part, and that's that's who they are. Uh, and not looking up and putting them and embedding them within the Jewish tradition, which we try to do, <laughs> take them out, uh, would not be quite honest. Um, the other... Um, uh, I, I, I think all of that somehow informs our rituals and hopefully enlivens them to be somewhat more truth, but they are rituals. And, uh, but I, I think the main thing is for me was basically to reemphasize how Mary, Joseph, and Jesus were Jews of the first century or 30th century or whatever it was. Uh, and that's important. We can't really understand him truthfully without that. I've always wondered what Mary would think about the way she's depicted today as St. Mary, you know, up on a pedestal, uh, seems yeah. to me so different than, than how she might have thought of herself back then. Certainly yep. how she presented herself in the I agree, yeah. Mm -hmm. I thought of that something similar. I don't know if we're gonna to get to it tonight, but the, in the last section about, um, about Anna the prophet, I thought that today about her, um, about what she would think. Um, I mean, most many of us have never heard of her. I hadn't, but um, but um, but she has been canonized by the Catholic Church, and I just wondered what she would, what I know I'm getting ahead, but what she would think about that. Um, let me let me take a stab at that last question about how it impacts me and ritual. I think regardless of what your ritual is, because there's many different ones in the Christian tradition, I feel like it puts me in a posture. I think we are beings of rhythm and habit and needing to do things over and over. And I think if you, it helps me get my mind right. And I, I, I think of posture when I think of that. That's a good word, Tom. Yeah, yeah. For that. I think, I think very much so. Kind of related to that, it also helps keep us accountable to each other and to God. Very good. Mm -hmm. I think for me during COVID, I came to really miss and appreciate our rituals and traditions because we couldn't have communion. And I felt something was terribly missing in my worship. And, and doesn't it also bind us together? I feel yeah. like this, this rituals bind us together, whether it's communion, which of course is a very significant part of the Christian faith, but other kinds of things, other things, baptisms, which also is very important, confirmations, um, so all of those, and, and what we do during Advent, what we do during Lent, doesn't that all bind us I think together? Because they're shared, mm -hmm. and as a community, we share that, and it, like you say, binds us together. Mm -hmm. I really do enjoy having your A, B, and C, and starting in Advent, and going to Christmas, and going to Epiphany and going to Lent and going to the season, Pentecost and the season, because it tells the story year after year after year, and it becomes part of who not only I am, but who we are. And uh, mm -hmm. I find that really strengthening and heartening for me. I like having a new year with Advent and uh, and when we come back at the, la at the King of Kings uh, Sunday, the last Sunday of the season after Pentecost. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it's really enriching because you can get new insights each time you go through it. Uh, it's not the mm -hmm. ritual and the tradition isn't dead. It's alive and, and churning. And, and, and that gives me some sort of excitement. I will just mention quickly, she closes that section talking about Marcionism. Marcionism? Mm -hmm. Carl alluded to briefly a minute ago, and 
Um, I'm not even sure why she put this in here or, um, but it is, and, and I think Victoria has some knowledge about this. So maybe when she has, um, her, when she's, when she's all well, maybe sometimes she can talk to us about it. Mm -hmm. but, but it's, it's the, the concept that the God of the Old Testament is distinct from the God that Jesus talks about. And, um, and it's a heresy, by the way. Marcionism is considered to be a heresy. And she and she tells us that I think because it, she, she mentioned yeah. that in the video. Yeah. Okay. So I think Rita, we're ready now for um Simeon? Yeah. Whatever well, for us. Or it is Oh Simeon. It we have, as as car talk guys say it, have wasted a wonderfully good hour. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Having great conversations. Um so I will are you done to finish or no we were i just wanted to say one thing at say, the end oh say at, something now we've, I, we have come to the end i want you all to know <laughs> this is per carl too because he called me up and uh, uh carl you might help me with this but uh everything in week one and week week two is now uh where it'd be easier for carl tell us how we can go back and see what's happened the first and second week are you there, Carl? You're, you're muted, Carl. Sorry. Um, it is the first two sessions are available by going to the church's website and look for service schedule. Click on that and scroll down and you will see video library. Click on that. And under video library, you'll see Advent series. And you can click on that and you will see session one and session two. Um, so go ahead, Carl. And you can you can watch 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 them there. And this one, I will try really hard to get this one processed tomorrow and get it posted sometime tomorrow. Thank you. Great service that you do. I appreciate yes. it. Well, you're welcome. <laughs> well, um, again, the reminder to send in your questions so that um, AJ has an opportunity to look at them and process them before she answers them. It should be fun. It will be great. Let us pray. Come, Lord Jesus. We give thanks that you have come to announce God's good news for the world. Guide us as we seek to encounter you in scripture and in our interactions with one another. Grant us the courage to say yes to difficult challenges we face in our own lives, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, thank you, Katie. Ladies. Thank you, Rita. Oh, oh thank you. Oh, Rita's trying I'm to do trying something. I'm trying to stop share. Thank you. But yeah, I it worked. Think I did it. it worked. Yeah, yeah. 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 I can't see you all, but I'll find you. <laughs> it doesn't look here. like oh, that picture. It doesn't. It doesn't look like that picture she just had of. Jesus out in the air like that. The New Church Nativity completely covers all over that. And you got to go through three denominations to get to where the grave is. Because <laughs> they have Greek Orthodox, oh. they have Catholic, and they have, and the, when you go to the Nativity, they sh the, the three churches share the time. They're never together. So it's sort of really very different. Hmm. But, uh, at, at the risk of, of, uh, of, of saying too much about this, I'm going to share a screen real quickly and uh, walk through what I just told you. You can see the church's website. And if you click on service schedule, you'll see video library at the bottom. And that's become clearer. That's better. And then under the video library, you'll see Advent series. We've also got the Lenten series was there. Mere Christianity is there. But you click on the Lenten series, and you'll see then the two that we've done already. And I'll put up the third one tomorrow. Thanks. And Thanks, for, those, for those of you that are excited about it, you can go back there and watch 
I think I, I can't. I, I think I've got the number close to right. You can watch eighty sermons from Bill. Wow! Wow! And after oh, that, not, you'll sit there and not say, all in one Why night. Why did I do that? <laughs> yeah. I think you should take a break in the middle somewhere. We could be. <laughs> I take a break after the first one. <laughs> If we have a question for um, next week, who do I send it to? Uh, ah. uh, you can send it to me uh, or or send it to the church if you want. Maybe that would be the easiest way to do it. Then just send it to, the, you all have the church's email. Just just send it to them. Okay. Office. Uh, Melinda. Office what? at, office at, stjom dot church. Thank you. Off, office at jom, j stjom dot church. We also have TG and Karen with us now. Karen was with us earlier. You yeah. saw her face, but now you see both of them in real living color. There you go. That is your TG and Karen, isn't it? <laughs> And Andy, thank you so much for being with us. You, you've enlightened, you enlightened yes. our, 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 our discussion tonight. Well, well, thank you for letting me join, and I, I'm excited to continue on. Okay. Well, great. Yeah. Please, great. Pl please join us on Sunday, too, Andy. 10, 10.30 on Sunday mornings, if you have time. And we Definitely. also have a Zoom worship as well. That's you Alabama think? time. Right, right. <laughs> That's right. Yes. That's spoken from our Georgian. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no time. So anyway, uh, I don't know if any other information. Do you have anything else, Rita or no. Kitty, Katie? Uh, where's our education director right here, Victoria? Do you do you please want to say anything? Kazoon tight. <laughs> <laughs> she just. Went, I... I'm just so grateful to the Lord for what he's doing each and every week. I, I'm just marveling at um, his, his love that's pouring forth through everyone. So can't wait for next week. And then with Amy Jill too. Laid my yeah. hand on you for healing. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sending you <laughs> prayers for healing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Definitely. I received them. Thank you.